Let's open our Bibles to the book of Acts. We will be looking at Acts chapter 7. Actually, we'll be backing up just a wee bit into Acts chapter 6, and then we'll be doing Acts chapter 7 today. So we're going to do a lot more reading than usual. So Lord, once again, we thank you so much for your grace, for your mercy. We thank you, Lord, that you are always faithful. We thank you, Lord, that we can just rest in the fact that you've got this. And we pray, Lord, as we go through this passage of scripture that you would open our eyes and um, make the precision strikes that only you can make through the power of your Holy Spirit. And as a result of that, we would be conformed more into the image of Christ and we would be bearing fruit. So Lord, have your way and receive all the glory today. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we have been studying the book of Acts, it's become pretty obvious that people in positions of power are often more concerned with power than the responsibility that comes with power. A lot of people just want to be running the show. And when that happens, then truth can be more of a hindrance rather than an ally. When your goal is just to be in power, stay in power, increase your power, then things that would come against that, even if they're truthful, there tends to be a little bit of resistance. So it's easy to be caught. I mean, obviously my mind jumps into the political spectrum, but also in so many other spectrums. That's why we need to be careful and when we're put in a position of power, that's, that's actually one of the reasons I'm, I'm not big into titles. I don't mean to be disrespectful, but sometimes someone will say reverend to me, and I'm like, no, no don't call me reverend, please, you know. Or all of these other titles. It's like uh, minister, which means servant, pastor, teacher. So that's... Um, about 20 years ago, we had a little ministry going in a coffee shop in Bradenton. And there was this woman there that she would come and she would often, the ladies would be chatting with Amira and this woman had some challenges that she was talking about. And uh, she didn't always like, agree with Amira's counsel but she was talking about a situation that she was struggling with. And then another man stepped in who had overheard the conversation and said to this woman, well, you should just divorce him. And Amira looked at him like, what? what? No, 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 no. And she kind of wanted to hear this. And it wasn't an abuse situation or anything like that. In fact, she was the one with, that had a lot of issues. And the guy, when Amira kind of like rebuffed that answer, the guy said to her, you can't talk like that. I'm a pastor. And Amira's like, as you know, that probably didn't impress her. <laughs> right? And so he said to her, I detect a rebellious spirit in you. And then he said, you need to be careful, young lady, because you could end up like King Saul, writhing and dying on the floor in the temple of God. And Amira's like, that's not how King Saul died. <laughs> <clears throat> it is a tragic thing when people in authority end up opposing truth for the sake of ego. And that's what ends up happening. At this point, the spiritual power brokers of the day are already jealous. And they're jealous because these uneducated, undignified fishermen are accomplishing more in their ministry than these dignified, educated priests. We don't like it when our little show of power becomes 
laughable. It's embarrassing when we try to flex and then all of a sudden we realize how pathetic we are. Uh, when I was younger, you know, my brother and I had a lot of different cars. We kind of drove some high-powered cars. And one of them, uh, my brother had a 67 GTO, and it was a nice car. It was fun. It was a lot of fun. That one had the, the 400, had 411 gears, and it was, it was fun, you know? Had a really nice tight shift, really nice tight throw. So you could just go through the gears burning rubber really easy, and, and it sounded great. And my brother loved to show that one off and do great burnouts with it. It was very manly. <laughs> Now the most embarrassing thing that can happen to a man when he's going through the gears showing off his high-powered car is to blow a gear, right? Miss a gear, right? You know, and then all of a sudden, you know, the, the tack goes up high and you, you look really bad. So we were riding around and I forgot who was with us. Someone was, was in the front seat, so I was in the back that day. And what I did is I took a, a, like a thin rope, twine, and I tied it to the shift and ran it down along the thing so it was in the back seat, so I, so I had it. And I saw to it that every time he went to, from that second to third gear throw, I gave it a yank. <laughs> and he missed it over and over and over. And he was so angry and so humiliated because it, it made him look so stupid to blow the gear, to blow the shift. And I had a good time doing that. But you know, here he is showing off power and looking silly. Now we don't, that's embarrassing. And we, we don't like when stuff like that happens. Now in Acts chapter six, we met Stephen. You remember Stephen was one of the seven. He was a Hellenistic Jew that was chosen to serve. And we went through that whole situation. And as we pick up today, his ministry is really starting to flourish. So in Acts, it says, in chapter 6, verse 8, it said, Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. So Stephen's doing great wonders and great signs among the people. And you say, well, how? Well, he, because he was full of faith and power, and, or faith or grace and power, depending on your translation. Then arose, verse 9, some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, those from Sicilia and Asia, and they were disputing with Stephen, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. So it's like they, they meet this guy, they're debating him, and he is outmaneuvering them. Because, you know, how? I don't think Stephen is you know, necessarily some super well-educated academia nut and a brilliant debater and went to all of these schools. I, it says he was full of the Holy Spirit. And I love that. I find great solace in that. I know I'm not the brightest watt bulb quite often, but I do know that the Spirit of God lives in me. And often I can be discussing issues with somebody who's far more intelligent than I am. But the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit. And sometimes a very simple statement being prompted by the Spirit will just jam a stick in the spokes of their logic to a point where I don't even understand the significance of what's going on until afterwards. I love it. So these guys are getting really, really frustrated by Stephen. It's like, it's like they keep blowing the shift. Every time they're, they're showing how smart they are and all of that, he, he's, they're being outflanked. And we're going to see what it's like to try to outwit a spirit-filled Stephen. It's kind of like the frustration the Pharisees had with Jesus. Remember when they would ask these trick questions and every time they asked questions, they ended up blowing up in their face and finally it said from that point on, they dare not ask him any more questions. So, rather than yield to the truth that threatens to expose them, they ended up doing what they do best. They cheat because they can't win fairly. So verse 11 says, Then they secretly induced men to say, We've heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. So they got the people in it. Now they're feeding into their self-righteousness. 
Verse 12, they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and seized him and brought him to the council. It's a familiar scene, really. And they also set up false witnesses. So here's some of the charges. This man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against the holy place. He's blaspheming the temple and the law. He's blaspheming the law. There's the charge. For we've heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. And you know, there probably was a grain of truth to their accusations. I'm sure Stephen spoke how uh, Jesus is, su is superior to Moses and how Jesus fulfilled the law. And, and he did it in a way that they couldn't refute and that Jesus is greater than the temple. But now the charge has been leveled in front of them. And now in, charge, in front of the Sanhedrin. In verse 15, it says, And all who sat at the council, looking steadfastly at him, saw his face as the face of an angel. What exactly does that mean? I mean, did he glow? I mean, that's the first thing I thought the first time I ever read that, the face of an angel. It must have been like, you know, all of a sudden he got really shiny, right? I'm not sure, because the more you look into it, the less I see that. But what I am sure is that he was at peace. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. I know that. He, therefore, he wasn't running on fear. He wasn't running on terror. I'm sure that he, he simply trusted God, was filled with his Spirit, and it showed. So you've got an angry group over here, and you've got one person totally at peace on the other side. And it's quite a, you know, a difference. When a person is close to God and he spends his time in his presence, he will reflect some of that glory. Right? And in some cases, like Moses, literally. Now, I don't know if that's the case here. If he actually, you know, all I know is he had the face of an angel. Chapter 7, verse 1. Then the high priest said, Are these things so? So, Stephen, you've heard the charges. You're blaspheming the temple. You're blaspheming the law. Are these things so? What say you? And Stephen is going to give a little panorama of the Old Testament history. And this is a great chapter for new believers. If you're just new or you're not all that familiar with the Old Testament, this is just a great flyover at 30,000 feet. You're going to learn so much. It helps put things in a timeline. Just will help people connect the dots. And I remember there's a couple of these uh, of chapters like this that really helped solidify the Old Testament. So it's really good. And Stephen's going to make a couple of points that they're going to have to contend with. And the main one that will be obvious is that, again, the religious leaders are treating Christians like they've always treated the prophets of God, with rejection. That's going to be the reoccurring theme. You're going to see that over and over. So here comes his history lesson. He said, Brethren and fathers, listen. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran and said to him, get out of your country and from your relatives and come to a land where I will show you. So there's a little reminder that every once in a while, God tends to do new things from time to time. And it's also worth noting that God dwelt with Abraham before there was a temple. He continues with his lesson. Then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran. And from there, when his father was dead, he moved him to this land which you now dwell. And God gave him no inheritance in it, even though, or I'm sorry, not even enough to set his foot on. But when Abraham had no child, he promised to give it to him for a possession and to his descendants after him. But God spoke in this way that his descendants would dwell in a foreign land and that they would bring them into bondage and oppress them for 400 years. 
and the nation to whom they will be in bondage, I will judge, said God, and after that they shall come out and serve me in this place. Then he gave them the covenant of circumcision, and so Abraham begot Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day, and Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot the twelve patriarchs. I'm sure they're like all familiar with this. Why are you even telling me all of this? But he continues here. And the patriarchs, becoming envious, sold Joseph to Egypt, but God was with him. See, I think Stephen is all, now he's hinting that the Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin here is envious of Jesus, envious of the Christians. And notice the patriarchs, these are the heroes of the Sanhedrin. He's saying they became envious of Joseph and they sold him and yet God was with Joseph. See how he's kind of like already starting to make, make this little accusation. God was with the very, ends up being God is with the very savior, Joseph in this case, that they reject. And the patriarchs being envious sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with him and delivered him out of all of his troubles and gave him favor and wisdom in the presence of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Now a famine and a great trouble came over all the land of Egypt and Canaan, and our fathers found no sustenance. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. And the second time, Joseph was made known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to the Pharaoh. Then Joseph sent and called out his father Jacob and all his relatives to him, 75 people. So Jacob went down to Egypt, and he died, he and our fathers. And they were carried back to Shechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham bought for a sum of money from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem. And now he's going to move from Joseph to Moses. But when the time of the promise drew near, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt until another king arose who did not know Joseph. And this man dealt, dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our forefathers making them expose their babies so that they may not live. At this time, Moses was born, and he was well-pleasing to God, and he was brought up in his father's house for three months. But when he was set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was learned in all wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in words and deeds." Now, when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel, and seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed, and he struck down the Egyptian. Verse 25 is interesting. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand, but they did not understand. So Moses thought the people would understand that he was their deliverer. And the next day he appeared to two of them as they were fighting and he tried to reconcile them saying, man, you are brethren, why do you wrong one another? But he who did his neighbor wrong pushed him away saying, who made you a ruler and a judge over us? See the point? They rejected Moses, God's man. Verse 28, do you want to kill me as you did the Egyptian yesterday? And at this saying, Moses fled and became a dweller in the land of Midian where he had two sons. And when 40 years had passed, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in a bush in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. So again, God appears, not in a temple. Stephen continues. When Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight as he drew near to observe, the voice of the Lord came to him, saying, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses trembled and dared not look. And then the Lord said to him, Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. 
I have heard their groanings and have come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send you to Egypt. Now listen to Stephen's point. I mean, it's been a long history lesson. Verse 35, this Moses, whom they rejected, saying, who made you a ruler and a judge? He's the one that God sent to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. And he brought them out after he shown wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness 40 years. So Moses was rejected, but he was the one God sent to deliver the nation. Just like Jesus was also rejected, he is the one that God sent to deliver us all from sin. Now, getting back to the hero Moses, this is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear. So Moses, whom they revere so much, promised that there will come another prophet. And he warned them that Israel should take special care to listen to this coming prophet. You see, he's saying, he, Moses told you to pay attention, to heed this coming prophet. But just like Israel rejected Moses, they are rejecting Jesus, who is the prophet Moses spoke of here. Continuing with Moses. This is he who was in the congregation of the wilderness with the angels who spoke to him on Mount Sinai with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give to us, whom our fathers would not obey, but rejected. And in their hearts, they turned back to Egypt, saying to Aaron, May gods to go before us. As for this Moses who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days, and they offered sacrifices to the idol and rejoiced in the work of their own hands. So even after God proved himself over and over again with all kinds of signs and wonders, they continued to reject Moses. Right down to the golden calf while he was going and getting these, uh, the oracles from God as he was getting the law. They would rather rejoice in the work of their hands. They would rather say, look what we have done. Kind of like the temple. You can't blaspheme the temple. But that's but they held the temple in such reverence. And their corrupt worship led them to judgment. Stephen continues, Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven. As it is written in the book of the prophets, Did you offer me slaughtered animals and sacrifices during the 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You also took up the tabernacle of Moloch, and the star of your God, Rephim, images which you made to worship, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Well, likewise, the takeaway here, we need to know that when we reject Jesus, we are given over to other things. When we're not embracing Jesus, what happens is that there's something else that we're going to be focusing on. Maybe it's just the God of self. Maybe it's the God of pleasure. Maybe it's power. Maybe, you know, uh, it's finance. Whatever it may be. If we're not surrendering to Jesus, something's going to have you. And meanwhile, when we're not looking to Jesus, what we don't understand is all the while, while we're pursuing whatever else we may be pursuing, we are forsaking our own mercy. Well, Stephen continues. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he appointed, instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern that he had seen, which our fathers, having received it in turn, also brought with Joshua into the land possessed by the Gentiles, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers until the days of David, who found favor before God and asked to find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house. 
However, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all these things? You see, and I know a lot of reading. Stephen is charged with speaking blasphemies against the temple. And he's saying, look, the presence of the temple or the tabernacle never kept you from rejecting God and his prophets. He's also saying, essentially, you guys are the idolaters here. You're the ones that are actually forsaking God and worshiping the temple. God doesn't dwell in houses made with hands. And so how can I be blaspheming the temple? And Christians kind of fall into this mindset sometimes as if God is here and God is, isn't here. Like we can, you can leave a service and you can say, oh, God was here, you know, God was here at the service, you know, and, 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 and then we act as if God's absent from us the rest of the week. And that's just not the way it works. Or if you, if, you know, you heard a sermon that you liked, you mean, oh, that was a great sermon. God was here. Good sermon, Pastor. God was here today. Well, I could tell you, he's here even if it's a bad sermon, right? He's still here. But we, we get kind of get caught up in this mindset. And some people even idolize the church in ways they don't even understand. I go to church. Well, that's good. That's nice. That's not what saves you. Going to church doesn't save you. But a lot of people act as if they're okay because they go to church. So, well, have you repented of your sins? Have you received the gift of righteousness? Do you understand the true heart of the gospel? Why Jesus was nailed to the cross for you and that he rose again and that God accepted that offering? God accepted that sacrifice on your behalf? I go to church. I, Christians can kind of fall into that same trap. Well, now it's time for the application. I mean, Stephen gave a long sermon, essentially a long history lesson. And I'm sure a lot of the Sanhedrin were tapping their toes and just getting a little more angry as they're picking up uh, the overtone of rejection by the religious leaders to the people that God has called. But now it's the application, verse 51. And Stephen doesn't hold back. Spirit-filled, by the way, remember that. Sometimes we, we think if, if, if a person is filled with the Holy Spirit, you know, they're just going to speak rainbows and beautiful things all the time is what's going to come out. It's like, ah, Jesus said some pretty harsh things. Whitewashed sepulcher, brood of vipers. And Stephen, filled with the Spirit, says, You stiff-necked. And uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Here's this point. It's like, wow. Tell them how you really feel, Stephen. <laughs> uncircumcised heart and ears. It's like, yes, you are like the God-rejecting Gentiles. And this really stung. Verse 52, which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom now you have become the betrayers and murderers. You're following the rejection, your father's rejection of God again. It's a cycle, and you're riding this cycle. You're doing the exact same thing. And isn't it interesting? Stephen is the one that's actually laying on the charges here. So you, you killed those who foretold the coming of the just one of whom you have become the betrayers and murderers who have kept the law by the direction of angels and have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. So you, you haven't kept the law. They've been blessed to receive God's word. And, and they blast, they're the ones that blaspheme God's word. Remember their charge. Blasphemy of the temple, blasphemy of the law. Man, did he turn the tables on them and show them how they are guilty of the very things they're charging him with. And from here on, we're going to catch a glimpse, maybe, 
of the, the spiritual conflict that goes on beyond the veil. In other words, I've, I've gone through this chapter, I don't know how many times, but as I was going through this in a little more detail, um, I, I realized how dark this scene really is, right? So it's kind of like, as we're going through this, uh, you know, ask the Lord to put on your, your spiritual glasses so you can catch a glimpse of the dynamics that's going on here in the spirit realm because it's extremely profound. Stephen gave a Holy Spirit-filled rendering of history and in, in, in light of the truth, what he's saying is going to unveil, take the, the, just show what is really going on here. Verse 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed at them with their teeth or gnashed at him with their teeth. So these men, their, their response, they didn't respond like, like I was going to say signified, dignified civil. Um, uh, they didn't respond that way. They didn't say, well, that's fascinating, that's L. They flipped out. They became completely unhinged. All their dignity, all their pomp, everything is out the window. It says they were cut to the heart. They were convicted. The truth of what he said was heard. And they react in rage. It says they gnashed at him. The word there is bruchu. It means to grate the teeth in pain or in rage. So see their faces. Their teeth are clenched. They're grinding them as they're talking. And they're all doing this. Their faces now, in, in light of the, the godly exposure of the truth, all of a sudden these religious people's faces are contorting and twisting. They've been unmasked. Under that face of, that outfit of piety that they've been wearing, uh, uh, under the garb of holiness that they wear, it's been stripped off of them and the true demonic essence is being seen for what it is. And now they're collectively seething under the light of this divine truth that has exposed them. They rejected God by rejecting Stephen. And now suddenly the godly mask is torn off of them. Now, when we're in a tough situation, and you're going to find yourself in difficult, it could be a hard, it could be a rebuke. So we don't take rebukes too well sometimes. We need to be careful in that. Sometimes your enemies are more honest about you and what's wrong with you. And rather than push back, we should say, well, is there truth to this? So uh, our difficulty can be a rebuke or it could be a trial, like where are we going to have church? Right? We can either react in the flesh and freak out, or we can respond in the spirit. Right? Reacting in the flesh is like, like from a guy's perspective, you, you shove me, I shove you back. A little harder. That's just, that's the flesh. That's reacting in the flesh. It's our knee jerk. Someone calls you a name or something like that, you're, you're quick to undermine them. Oh yeah, like you know what you're talking about. You say something negative about my kids. Aren't your kids the one that did? It's like we, we, we react in the flesh. Or will we respond in the spirit? Let God have his way. Well, here clearly they're reacting. Totally Letting, actually, they, I, I, I probably should correct that. They are responding in a spiritual way, but very much in the negative. Look at this profound juxtaposition here. We see these people collectively gnashing their teeth with their face contorted in this weird rage and there you have Stephen, whose face is like an angel. And he has the most astonishing vision. 
Verse 55, but he, Stephen, being full of the Holy Spirit, what a contrast, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Like, spiritually, this is an incredibly intense event that's happening. And Stephen said, look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. So Stephen, as we know, is about to die. And he sees Jesus standing at the right hand. And, and that's actually a first, right? Because he's supposed to be sitting at the right hand. That's, that's what we always see. So Stephen, this is, he, this is such a significant event that not only it, does Jesus appear to him and is supporting him, but he's standing as he's welcoming the very first of millions Christian martyrs. And as Stephen is proclaiming what he's seeing, it is way too much for this dark counsel to bear. You know, recently, Jesus kind of, before the same body of people, uh, declared that he would be sitting at the right hand of the Father. Remember? And he said that, and they were like, blasphemy, what more do you need? There it is. And they had the same reaction. And they sealed his death as a blasphemer as a result of this. And now Stephen is saying that he sees Jesus sitting at the right hand, or standing at the right hand. And they flip out. Verse 57 and they cried out with a loud voice, and they stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord. And as I looked at this, it, the word there, when it says they, they cried out, the word there is kradzo. They were shrieking. They're not just grinding their teeth and contorting their face. They're shrieking. And it says they covered their ears. The word there means to press. They, your translation might say stopped. They stopped their ears. Like, and we might think like they did this. Like, we don't want to hear. No, no, no. They were pressing. They were, so look at the picture, shrieking, grinding their teeth, squishing their heads. This is dark stuff. And then they all rush him, all at the same time. They charge him. And they cast him out of the city, verse 58. And they stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Saul? None other than the, the, the soon-to-be great apostle Paul. He's there. He's watching. He consents. And we know, and we'll find out later, that Stephen's death had a very profound impact on Saul. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. That's an interesting verse. I, again, a verse I've read a hundred times. Um, you know, as you grow in the Lord, you can look, read something super simple, and then all of a sudden go, oh, I never saw that before. So maybe, I went, maybe you caught it. But Stephen called on God, it says, Stephen called on God, saying, Lord Jesus. Well, that's significant. One of the many verses that kind of point out the deity of Christ. I just, I just never connected that dot before until I was just actually finishing up the message. I was like, oh yeah, there's another one. I have most of them highlighted in my Bible, but I, I missed that one. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And we know the faithful Lord will do just that. Quite a, quite a gruesome scene, actually. I don't know if you've ever, you know, seen an image of somebody being stoned to death or something like that. It's not like, you know, they just take little rocks and throw them at them. Like, no, they, they crush them. And it's, it's brutal. He knelt down, cried out with a loud voice, verse 60, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he said this, he fell asleep. Stephen shows the same heart as our Lord did on the cross. 
asking God to forgive his accusers. And interestingly, we know in part, at least through Paul, that prayer is going to be answered. He fell asleep only to awake in a much better place. You know, when you are really living for the Lord, it changes things to such a point that heaven isn't a threat. Like we, we talk about bad situations and stuff, but when, when you're really, really living for God and somebody's threatening you with the worst thing, what's the worst thing? What's the worst thing they can threaten you with if heaven's not a threat? It's kind of like when Lazarus was resurrected from the dead, what do you think it took to scare him? I'll bet you can't scare Lazarus after that. Right? It just, it changes things when you have that perspective. How we respond during persecutions, trials, it's going to affect other people. We need to be mindful of that because all you got to do is nothing and forget that. Right? You're going to be put on the spot and people are going to be looking to you. And you can come unglued and that's going to impact people. Or you can have faith and, and lead on and that's going to impact other people. We need to be mindful because sometimes we're oblivious to our own wake. We don't realize what we're disrupting. We're just busy being ourselves. And sometimes that's a good thing and sometimes not so much. People are watching. And not only are they watching, but they're going to know by watching you as you're being put in whatever pressure cooker, whatever curveball life is throwing at you, as they're watching you, they're going to either know just by watching whether your faith is real or whether they, or they'll see you for the hypocrite that you are. They're just going to see it. How can we endure trials? Because they're coming. How can we endure trials with grace? Well, the answer is being full of the Spirit. We need to be full of God's Holy Spirit. We need to seek the Holy Spirit. I know I've said it many times, but a lot of times we're just an anxious, restless people. We don't prioritize His presence the way we should. Sometimes when we pray, you know, and there's like silence, we get all squirmy. We can't endure a lot of silence before the throne. It's not like, like you've opened the doors and you're standing before the throne room of God and he's tapping his toe saying, you got something you want to say? That's not the way it is. I learned when, uh, with my first child, my daughter Crystal, when she was little, and she called me one day from the other room, Dad, Dad! I said, I'm right here. She crawled over. And she sat at my feet, and I'm looking at her. And then she, like, what, she distracted her. I'm looking at her like, what? And she's like, la, 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 like off in another world. And it took me a minute, and then I realized she just wanted to be at her daddy's feet. And I was like, overwhelmed by what a beautiful reality she didn't have to have anything to say the desire to be at her daddy's feet was the most rewarding thing so when you're praying and, and you go before the throne and it's like uh, I got nothing I'm sorry I didn't mean to you know take up your time no 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 Trust me, it, your Heavenly Father delights the fact that you just need to be in His presence. Don't, don't allow the enemy to get you all squirmy like that. I tell people, you, you'll go to, to uh, um, Bush Gardens and stand in line for an hour for a three-minute thrill ride. Eight minutes of silence and prayer and you get all freaked out and squirmy. And in, in Jesus' name, amen, and hang up. Uh, we need to be filled with the Spirit. And sometimes we're not willing to press for that. We want a convenient filling. Right? Lord, fill me on the fly. Right? I'm not going to take time for you, but I want you to do this for me. Yeah. We need to be filled with the Spirit because we're going to be going through trials and we want to endure them with grace.
Stephen's message is very simple, really, to understand. It's a simple message, but it's hard to digest. Simple to comprehend, but hard to digest. You who love God, why don't you wake up and stop rejecting what you say you love? Remember Stephen pointed out their hypocrisy, how they worshiped Moses and yet didn't keep the law about the coming prophet whom they were supposed to heed. They rejected the very prophet Moses told them would come. And instead of us looking at, and, and then the temple and all, instead of looking at the irony of all of this, let's find the application. And that is, remember the words of our Lord in Luke chapter 6, verse 46. When he said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? I mean, it, it makes no sense. Lord is, to, is he to whom you submit to. You can't call him Lord and not be submitting. If only we could see our own hypocrisy as uglier than the hypocrisy of others. That would help us all out a lot. James tells us in James chapter 1, verse 21, Therefore, laying aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls, but be doers of the word and not hearers only. And then listen to this, because those who are hearers but not doers, he says, are only deceiving yourselves. So you might be hearing it and saying, I got it. But if we're not, if we're not living it, we're deceiving ourselves. In fact, hearing it and hearing it and not living it is, is worse than not hearing it. Because we can't plead ignorance. So we, as we're filled with the Spirit, you know what He's going to do? He's going to give you the humility and the integrity to see the illusion of control that you're making believe, to see things as they are rather than as you choose to see them. James continues, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in the mirror. He observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of a man he was. It's kind of an interesting, it's like if I'm upstairs in the mirror and I look and I've got, you know, my hair's all disheveled and there's spinach in my teeth and I'm looking at, and then all of a sudden I, I go downstairs to the party. It's like, well, we're not, it's like, why did you even bother looking? Are you a hearer or a doer? Imagine if like down the road the church grew and we split this aisle and this aisle and, and we had a sign, these are the hearers and he these are the doers. And as you walk in, an usher says, hearer or doer, which side are you on? That's what a weird concept, huh? Yeah. Where would you sit though? Especially if you knew God is going, you know, God sees this. It's just a weird... We don't want to forget, or we don't want to um, reject this truth of the Scripture. We don't want to forsake our own mercy. We don't want to live a life of hypocrisy. We don't want to be more concerned about control and uh, perception of other people. Right? The Scripture tells us fear of man brings a snare. We want to be doers. And in doing so, we need His Spirit to rule in us. Because if His Spirit is ruling in me, then I won't be a reactionary person. There'll be far less regret in my life. Because people around me, people around you, are watching you, and they want to know if this is real. And as the world is becoming a little more nervous, day by day, and people are getting more anxious. They need to see if what you're professing, that peace that surpasses understanding, if you've actually got it. And if you're being filled with the Spirit, they'll see it. And the last thing is this. Stephen, what an amazing life. What an amazing ministry. Can you, what an amazing, the very first Christian martyr. And he started off just serving tables in the house of God. It's amazing what God can do if we say, here I am, use me. Right? Remember the bumper sticker? Your ability that's going to avail to God is really your availability 
to God. You get points for showing up and saying, Lord, use me for your glory. So, Lord, we thank you so much. We thank you for this chapter, and we know we did a lot of reading, and there's a lot to it, but, Lord, help us to be humble enough to see the application and realize we don't want to play the fool. If Stephen were to come before us and point out our hypocrisy, Lord, well, well we don't need Stephen, Lord. We have you. We have your Holy Spirit. Allow us, Lord, to convict us so that we would just come before you and say, Lord, try me. Expose me, Lord. Show me, Lord. And show me the price of those things that I haven't been willing to forsake. Show me the price as I realize I'm losing intimacy with you, not hearing your voice in my life anymore. And help us, Lord, to have the humility to repent so we can be vessels in your hands, so we can be bearing fruit and we can be living it, not just talking the talk, but really living it so that we can have fruit around us and we can one day go before you casting our crowns at your feet saying, look at what a beautiful thing you have done with my surrendered life. Lord, we thank you so much for your word and for this time. In Jesus' name, amen.